Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Movies We Can Learn From, and we're reviewing the Greyhound movie, which is a very interesting experience with history in the Battle of the Atlantic in 1942. A remarkable movie about an American destroyer, but it comes from a book. And so there are, there are parts of it that are accurate fact uh, taken out of history. There are parts of it that come from a book. C.S. Forrester, The Good Shepherd, and I guess that means that this destroyer by the name of Greyhound was a shepherd for the convoys crossing the Atlantic. So for this discussion, we have uh, Shackley Ruffero, uh, associated with the Marine Corps uh, and, and the Navy. Did I get that right? Yes. And, okay, and Michael Weary, who had a, a career in the Navy and has a lot of shipboard experience, and we are going to talk about that. So uh, let's begin with you, Shackley. What's the historical context of all this Battle of the Atlantic? Why is it something we should know about, and if we don't, we need to learn about? Well, um, okay. there, it's a huge subject. Let me start by saying that. So I probably won't do it justice, but Basically, it, it was the longest continuous battle of World War II. Uh, I don't think a lot of people realize that. Uh, it started in September 1939 when Britain declared war on Germany after Germany uh, attacked Poland and didn't end until the very end of the war in 1945. Um, and it basically involved uh, the Allies uh, and and before the before the U.S. got into the war, including the U.S. on a pretty high level, and Canada supplying um, materials through merchant vessels uh, to England uh, because England was be becoming isolated. And uh, after Hitler um, lost the Battle of Britain, which was in the uh, uh, summer and fall of, of 1940, where he tr he thought he could attack Britain and and subdue it by air and then land in Britain. When he gave that up and then turned against Russia, uh, he, he decided that uh, he could use naval assets, naval and air assets, to starve Britain into submission by stopping the flow of materials from the Allies and from the, from the Dominions and the um, rest of the British Empire, places like India and Ceylon and places like that. And uh, the Germans uh, tried to do that uh, by using U-boats. We, we use that term, but it's actually Unterseeboot, which which is German for undersea boat. And and uh, Churchill actually coined that term. He said, "We're going to call those guys U-boats, and ours are the good guys. We're going to call us submarines." <laughs> and, uh, uh, but they. They, they relied mostly on U-boats, um, but they also relied upon surface raiders, auxiliary raiders, and actually employed pocket battleships to go out and attack merchant uh, ships. And they also had, the only four-engine bomber that the Germans ever built was the Falk Wolf 200 um, Condor, which they used to go out and find the convoys to direct the submarines to. And then and then they also bombed uh, merchant ships with it, and they actually sunk a few merchant ships. But most of the destruction was done by these U-boats, and that included Italian U-boats, by the way, until the Italians left the war, although most of, the, most of it was German U-boats. And uh, the Allies tried to combat that by grouping, uh, after the initial beginning, when the Germans uh, put their U-boats their to sea, they didn't have very many, they only had about like 70 at the beginning of the war. Uh, and they were going out and they were attacking individual boats, uh, individual ships. Uh, but the, eventually the Allies decided it was better to put to group the ships together in convoys, groups of ships, and then to escort the ships with surface warships, like destroyers, destroyer escorts, corvettes, and so on. But the, in the beginning, there was a real shortage of those kind of ships because uh, even when the U.S. got in the war, we, had, we were dealing with the Pacific as well. And then there was a whole theater of war down in Africa, Operation Torch and Maramal in North Africa and all that. And that, they needed convoys uh, or warships to escort convoys down there as well. So there was a real shortage of ships and also technology. And in the beginning, uh, the Germans seemed to have the technological advantage. Uh, and so, uh, and also they, they uh, engaged in a huge uh, construction uh, program to build more U-boats. In fact, they built 
hundreds of them during the war and put them to sea. And uh, the turning, during the, during the beginning part of the war, there was a gap called the Atlantic Gap. And that was right in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and we, we could send escort ships across with the convoys, but we couldn't cover them with air. And air power was, became very important as the war went on in defeating the U-boats because the U-boats had to, had, to, had to submerge to avoid being uh, bombed by the, by the, by the bombers, uh, uh, mostly B-24s that we built and, and provided to the British. And we could either keep them uh, submerged so that they couldn't uh, go after the convoys or they could, they could be attacked. But in the beginning, uh, up until about May of 1943, there was this big gap in the center. And I think that that's probably depicted in the movie. And that's, that's where the action with the submarines occurs. Uh, in any case, uh, we had terrible losses. Just to give you some statistical idea, uh, during the during the war, we lost to merchant ships um, three thousand five hundred merchant ships. The Allies lost, and one hundred and seventy five warships in the Battle of the Atlantic. Over seventy two thousand sailors and merchant seamen were killed, and on the German side, uh, seven hundred and eighty three U boats and forty seven other surface warships were were sunk. And on, uh, in the U-boat arm, 40,000 U-boat sailors, 30,000 of them died during the war. So it was a huge, huge, long-term cataclysmic uh, war. And there was also a technological war on each side. And that's what I think really turned the tide for the Allies eventually, is we, we cracked the Enigma code. We developed sonar and methods of delivering uh, depth charges and hedgehog bombs on these submarines. And we had radio, uh, radio direction finders called Huff Duff and some other technology and radar first uh, locating U-boats on the surface. And then we, we they even had a, developed a pr uh, procedure for airplanes to attack U-boats on the surface at night because the U-boats U-boats in those days were diesel electric, and so they had to come up to recharge their batteries at night, and then they could submerge and use electric batteries. But so they were on the surface at night, and the airplanes couldn't find them initially. So they mounted these huge lights on the bombers, and the bombers, and put radar on the bombers, so the radar, the, the bomber crew could see the, the U-boat on the surface with the radar and then at the last minute turn the light on before the submarine could submerge and they'd go in and attack it. And that worked that worked really well. But in the in the when the, the Atlantic Gap existed, they couldn't do that. So there was this exposure that occurred in the middle of the Atlantic and uh, Admiral Donuts, who was in charge of the uh, of the U-boat arm, he had this dream of using wolf packs of large groups of, of submarines together. He had thought of this in World War I when he was a submariner, and uh, he put it into, into effect. And he would array, uh, say, 10 or 15 U-boats uh, in the, what he thought was the, uh, the course of the convoy, and then communicate with them by radio to gather them in certain areas, and then they would they would work together to attack the convoy convoy from different directions at night and otherwise, and they were very, very effective up until about 1943 when uh, things began to turn against the U-boats. Uh, That's a basic uh, background. Oh, wow, you know, the thing, the thing about it is at the time, a lot of this was classified and the public in the U.S. didn't really know what was going on. There was so much action going on in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, and only only later you know, did we find out uh, all all of these statistics you're talking about and all of these challenges. I'm reminded of the bowfin at Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. which uh, you know you can go on the bowfin and you can see really pre-technological devices. Um, and and I think that's part of uh, of the Greyhound. Um, these these devices they had the these routines that they that you you saw in the movie were actually before they developed, um, you know, uh, destroyer technologies. And as you say, Shackley, it was uh, only a, a few years in when the U.S. kind of caught up with the technology and was able to defend against the U-boat. 
Let's let's uh, let's talk to you now, Michael. Um, <clears throat> tell us about your experience on destroyers and on ships and on bridges. I mean, I, I am I was uh, in the Coast Guard. I, I did some investigations and legal work um, involving things that happened on bridges, but I I really have never been so close to the action on a bridge as with this movie. And you must have really uh, enjoyed and learned from the the depiction that Tom Hanks made of life on the bridge. Can you talk about it? Well, the visual effects of what it was like being on the bridge during combat, close quarters, uh, they're, they're maneuvering their ships right and to the left of them, their submarines, um, and they've got torpedoes. So what reigns uh, on the bridge is almost chaotic. It looks almost chaotic. Oh, uh, just seconds can make the difference between survival and success. And it, it's very important on a bridge that you communicate clearly, that you follow the protocol so everybody understands what the commands are. Um, and, uh, but, but I like the fact that they demonstrated what it was like to be on the bridge of a ship under those conditions. And I've, I've been in combat, uh, but I didn't have submarines chasing me, so I didn't have that kind of chaos. But we used to do what they call operational readiness inspections, and they would throw everything at us, just like what was going on on that bridge. They would have torpedoes, they would have bombs, they would have planes attacking us. Uh, we would uh, <laughs> we would have casualties. The captain was uh, knocked unconscious. We lost ship steering. We had to go into after steering. I mean, all different kind of chaotic things. This thing vividly describes and shows just in a visceral way what it's like to be on a ship there. So, I, I mean, it's, uh, I enjoyed it from that standpoint because it was very realistic emotionally. The, you know, you could feel it. It was like you, you're always on the edge of your seat. That's the way it is. Well, that was really something with Tom Hanks. Uh, he wrote the screenplay, as you mentioned, um, and it moved so fast. And, um, and I, I had the impression, although I haven't been there as you, um, that uh, things move very fast in, a, in a, a, an emergent situation on the bridge of a destroyer. Um, but the question is, um, did, they, did they give us an accurate picture of what it might have been like in 1942? Yes. Yes, they did. That's, uh, there's no question in all my readings, the, uh, the situation where the the, both the um, the convoy and then the escort, how they're dealing with this submarine threat. Um, the one thing I was uh, that was a little different. Protocol required zigzagging, and Tom Hanks, against regulations, made a choice in the movie to steam across the Black Pit, this place in the middle where where they had all the threats, uh, and and that would have been against regulation. Um, most of these convoys, remember, these convoys, the biggest one was 166 ships. Wow. They're in multiple columns, and they're three or three to 600 yards apart from the ship in front of you, behind, and a 1,000 between the columns. And they had a system with a zigzag clock where the, every ship had the same clock, and it was time, and the clock would do an alarm, and they would... In unison, like like a school of fish, they would turn left, and then ten minutes later, alarm would go off, and then they would turn right. Uh, I don't know how they were able to do that without collisions, but they were they they were successful in that. Um, but uh, there was a collision in the movie. Yes, I think they were trying to point uh, trying to point th those things out to us, little little vignettes. So, for example, small thing. But um, one of the men on the, the bridge uh, sneezed. You remember this? He sneezed in the middle of an operation, and he could not repeat the command. Um, and, yeah. and when it was all done, he was able to repeat the command because he finished the sneeze. But the captain turned to him and said, I hope you won't do that again. Uh, did we, they, can't, they, we can't have you. <laughs> they did that in the book, too. Um, it, is, it was so important on the bridge, that the bridge orders follow protocol. And unfortunately, a lot of the commands were not. 
Um, sometimes um, the the officer of the deck um, would assume the the you know there's one person has the con has control of the ship, so it's an officer of the deck or it's a commanding officer. But you always make it clear to the, everybody on the bridge who has the con because that's the person you take the orders from. And then he gives clear orders to the helmsman, for example. He says, right standard rudder. And sometimes the helmsman in the movie would say, aye, aye, sir. Well, I can tell you from experience, even when the helmsman says, right standard rudder, aye, aye, sir, as a response showing that he heard the order and he's carrying it out, even then, sometimes he gets it wrong. But for, for the OD to say, uh, right standard rudder, and the helmsman says, aye, aye, sir, that, that's just completely wrong. It's, it's, it's inappropriate. And they did it several times in the movie, and I was, I was disappointed in that particular thing. Uh, what's, so what's, the correct, what's the correct procedure? Whatever command you give, the helmsman or the lee helmsman does the engine order uh, telegraph, and the helmsman is driving. So if you give an order to the helmsman, right standard rudder, the helmsman says, right standard rudder, I sir, I I sir. So you know it's right, it's right standard. Or you give all ahead full, and the Lee helmsman said, all ahead full, sir, I I sir. So he's telling me that he heard what I told him to do. He asked Michael, "What you know? What, uh, uh, what is right standard, brother?" Um, and and uh, there was all these commands going on. And it, it's forty-five degrees to the right, or forty-five degrees to the left. But then there were other right rudder commands also. Well, there's and hard. So, that's hard yeah. rudder. Hard right is all the way over, and that's <laughs> that's really. I mean, you're really on the rudder to go hard rudder, hard over. He, and he would say hard right rudder, which was correct, and then he would say hard over. That was redundant, and that would never have happened in the Navy. There were a lot of commands like that. You really wondered about it. But, you know, I, just, just to talk about the technology for a minute, I visited the bridge on one of these cruise ships, uh, which was docked here in Honolulu. They took us up to the bridge, and uh, we had a wide space from one side of the ship to the other, a lot of, a lot of space. Um, but the guy who was running the ship sat at a small console, and he had a, a little wee computer, like a laptop. And with that, he ran the ship. He turned it, he stopped it, he started it, all that, and by pushing keys on a keyboard uh, immediately, and without any need to repeat it. It was it was all automated. Um, and I kept thinking of that on the destroyer. That you know there was room for failure, room for mistakes. And yet the technology now would never permit that anyway, right? No, we, the, uh, the destroyers McC McCain and Fitzgerald uh, collided two or three years ago. And in both cases, the people on the bridge lost the bubble. They, they completely lost their understanding of what's around them, who's around them. Uh, when I'm on the bridge, I know where every contact is, and I have a... CPA, closest point of approach on each contact constantly. So I always know, yeah, am I going to have a collision or I've got, I've got wiggle room? Uh, but, but even with sometimes, Jay, having too much technology is not a good thing. Uh, the tried and true work. We never had collisions. I'm mean, actually never had, never came close. And we were in, in, in South Vietnam where you'd be sailing through thousands of fishing junks and we avoided them but sometimes technology you know you rely on it too much and and not relying on your own judgment and keeping aware of of your of your sea space around you now well it's certainly a destroyer in 1942 um it, it's very tactile um kinetic um you could reach over and you could see the, the submarine um, passing you, you could you could shout out at them, and they could shout out at you even while you were uh, doing broadsides with your weapons. Yeah. Um, it was it was really different than what you might expect. It was very close proximity kind of kind of war. Um, I, I'm sure that wouldn't happen today, but in those days, it must have been horrifying. 
um, to be shooting at somebody, which is, you know, maybe 20, 30 yards away. Well, think about all the people that were on that ship, and that's exactly how they were. They had phone talkers. They had messengers of the watch. Both wings had uh, lookouts. Uh, there was a helmsman and a lee helmsman who was doing the engine order telegraph. You had a quartermaster who was keeping track of, of the navigation. You had an officer of the deck, a junior officer of the deck. Plus, in the back, you had the combat information center where the, where the, uh, the XO was. And they had what they call a dead reckoning plot. And they're plotting all of the contacts, all of the uh, su whatever submarine contacts. And then they had a grease board. And they would write up all the contacts and update them constantly on the grease board. Un unfortunately, they weren't normally you're writing behind the, east, the grease board backwards. But these guys were writing in front, blocking it from the executive officer. So that would, was... Would would that have been in the combat information center or on the bridge? Would have been both. In both. You have you have it on both. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to, Jay, want to make one comment about Hanks, uh, J Tom Hanks' characterizations. Now he did a great job, but one thing that I didn't feel that that was true with any commanding officer, I've, and I've served under many commanding officers. And that is, he kept showing emotion. You saw this troubled look in his eyes, and he'd be sometimes visibly tired and seem vulnerable, and he'd be looking at his subordinates, and he's making a difficult decision. Do I pick up these people that are in the water, or do I go save the boat? And that's not the way a commanding officer projects himself. He has to project control and that he had confidence in him and the in the uh, crew, and this is what C.S. Forrester wrote. He's this is what Pat, Tom Hanks' character in the book was saying to himself: "He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city." It was his duty to stay unangered, to speak in a flat tone with every word distinct, and with no trace of emotion. That's the only part of his characterization that I think did not, did not characterize a, a commanding officer or a destroyer. Mm, wow. It must have been something to serve on a bridge. You know, you make me think of the relationship between the commanding officer and the executive officer. In this movie, the executive officer, uh, Charlie Cole was his name, was played by uh, Stephen uh, Graham. And I thought from the outset that that he was just right in being, you know, not being too close to the captain, um, in calling him sir every time, um, in uh, acceding to his uh, commands and wishes every time, but also being able to offer advice in a critical situation. I thought the relationship they portrayed between the captain and the XO was right on the mark. What about you? How did you That's react to that? Critical, critical. I um, of course, I worked with many commanding officers and executive officers, and I had five reserve commands, and I had my own executive officer, and that that relationship is critical. The captain runs the ship; he makes the decisions, but and the and the XO, he's doing more of the running of the ship. The ca the captain is directing it, but the XO is helping to run the ship, and and he's going to be the first one to tell the CEO. If if he's got a problem, to they they may make a decision that maybe he has to th rethink it, um, and and a good CO will will always have this XO. Please, if I'm if I'm going over a cliff, tell me before I do it, because I'm not perfect. So, sure. And and that relationship was was a good relationship. I thought. Well, this was uh, this uh, came up in the in the course of the Greenville incident uh, off Waikiki. Um, in, uh, oh, what is it, uh, 2001. 20, 20, uh, uh, <clears throat> and one of the issues that the Court of Inquiry looked at was command climate. And that means the nature of the relationships on the bridge of the Greenville submarine. <clears throat> and did the crew and the other officers uh, feel comfortable in, in saying, command, sir, you better think that over. That may be wrong. And the happen. captain... It yes. didn't happen on the on that ship, that, that submarine. Yeah. 
Right. Well, maybe the Navy has, uh, you know, picked up on that over the years and learned more about it because he could have been a queen the same way, right? He could have made mistakes. And if, right. if there wasn't any command climate to permit somebody to correct him, it would have been a disaster. Um, I, I knew a guy that his job was to go around and teach commands how to communicate. And he told me an example of an airplane and some grunt in the back notices that their hydraulics are are going out. And so he calls up the captain and the captain says, don't bother me. Okay. And the plane crashed. That, and that's somewhat of what happened on that ship with Captain Waddle. Uh, one of the one of the enlisted realized that there was a problem, but you know you couldn't tell him anything because he was he knew everything. He was he was Superman, so you can't you can't tell. You've got to have a free flow of communication, a willingness for a subordinate to tell a boss, "Hey, you got a problem here." Yeah, that was a lesson of the Court of Inquiry that investigated that. You know, Shackley, one thing, one moment I thought was uh, was really critical is they needed air cover as as you talked, as you spoke. Um, and so they come they come a point where the uh, air cover from from the United States side of this this voyage um, couldn't cover it. They didn't have the range. And um, uh, as Michael mentioned, there was this thing called the the black pit in the movie. Um, where the air cover coming from the European side couldn't find the range, didn't have the range, and so they were exposed. And uh, the ship uh, ran into trouble in the middle, and they had, you know, some sinkings and some attacks by the submarines, and they lost, um, they lost, uh, I don't know how many ships and and uh, and men. So now the captain is is on the bridge. With the executive officer, and he asks the executive officer to come out on, a, I guess, on the flying bridge outside, because he has to have a private conversation with him. Mm -hmm. And he says, "I, I want to, uh, you know, steam straight for Europe. I don't want to do zigzag, and I want help. I want the European side to send out these these planes to support us and uh, and and bomb the submarines." Um, but I don't want to give away the fact that we're in extremists over here and that we have these losses and concerns. So what message should we send to the Admiralty in England? It was very, very interesting. And the two of them drafted the message. Um, the first draft was something, it was only a few words. The first draft was something like, uh, uh, in, we're in trouble. Um, we have an urgent need for your support. And then they decided um, uh, uh, we need we need your help uh, immediately. And then they finally decided the two of them working drafting this together. The, the the CO and the XO drafted this message, and finally they came to one word: help. And why? Because they thought that would that would bypass the the, the Germans who were listening for their radio traffic. Um, in this kind of interaction between the, the commander and the executive officer and the drafting of the message, there were a lot of messages. I was very impressed about how Tom Hanks could spit out this message and say, send. But this one was the most special message of all. And it worked. <laughs> yeah, except I, I don't know that they had they had air power to, to, to come to the rescue. Unless they were at the edge of... The pit was the mid-Atlantic mid gap that I'm talking about. And the reason there was a gap is because they didn't have air cover. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in fact, they had a, uh, a, the British had a, um, a, a real shortage of aircraft at the beginning. Uh, this is, if this was in 42, they'd still have a shortage. And they had requested bombers, those B-24s that I mentioned that were long range, they'd requested those from the, from the U.S., but um, the uh, Eighth Air Force wanted the bombers to bomb Germany because they were bombing Germany at the same time, right? And trying to to destroy their industry. So yeah, that's another movie, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. 
But but they 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 didn't have a lot of of uh, those bombers in the first place. But when they got them, then that's what they used them for was to cover that gap. And then they brought aircraft carriers in. And another interesting thing is that that Condor, the German Condor four-engine bomber that I mentioned, would come out and would find the convoys and direct, you know, through radio communications, direct the U-boats, and uh, the and then attack some of the uh, ships. Well, the British tried uh, mounting uh, hurricane fighters on merchant ships so that they could launch them when these condors would come around. And they actually did this several times, shot about four of them down. They launched them, and they, they go up and they shoot the condor down, and then they'd have to land in the sea and hope to get picked up. And I guess some of them were lost, of course, but, but that actually uh, was one way that they tried to solve that air cover problem in the beginning. And then later they brought in escort carriers, uh, which had their own aircraft, and, and that helped a lot as well. And changed things. So yeah. this, this um, you know, the experience in the movie was good for a couple of years. And after that, um, you know, the U.S. found ways to alleviate the risk. But uh, I wanted to ask you both this question, and, I, and I, it's worth discussing. I'll ask you first, Jack Leah. What's the message here? Tom Hanks, as I mentioned uh, early on, um, is a great patriot. He really cares about the country. He makes movies. He's been in so many movies and depicting how, you know, the, the, American, the American strength uh, will prevail on the battlefield, has prevailed on the battlefield. And this is another battlefield. And this is another Tom Hanks movie. Um, and it's, you know, this movie was, was made uh, only a few months ago at a cost of $50 million or so. Um, and, and then, um, but uh, Apple bought it for $80 million, so there's some spare change there. Um, but what I'm saying is that there's a message that Tom Hanks wanted to deliver, as in all his movies, uh, now, you know, 2023, 2024. What is the message you think he wanted to deliver by, by this movie? Never forget. He wants people to know about World War II because the people who participated in World War II are almost all gone now. So there are no firsthand memories uh, except those that are recorded here and there. And uh, I'll bet if you ask the young person, uh, Gen Z -er or whatever, uh, what the Battle of Atlantic was about, he, they'd say, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> and uh, by, by doing these movies, and he's, he's usually a real stickler for authenticity. That's why when they had the, the taunt from the, allegedly from the U-boat captain, you know, over the radio, I was, I was really disappointed in that because that was nonsense. That made it, that was a Hollywood movie thing. And usually he's very, very good on authenticity in the Band of Brothers and in the Pacific and then in Masters of the Air. That's one of the things that I really like about his. Don't movie. forget Private Private Ryan. Saving Private Ryan was a great movie. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, I think I think he just wants people to, younger people to know and not forget. Michael, what do you think? What do you think the message was? And the second part of my question is, is the message likely to be received and appreciated by the target audience? Well, A, this is the greatest generation. So we're telling the story of real patriots. Mm -hmm. But but also uh, the message is these people are out there fighting for us, fighting for our families at home, uh, fighting for a, an ideal, uh, defeating uh, Nazis, Germany, and Japan, fascism, uh, fighting for our way of life. And that's what our soldiers and Marines and, and uh, Coast Guard and, and airmen are doing there, out there today. They're doing it now. And if we can get that message out, that's a powerful message. And I, and I would hope that people would see that not just for the entertainment, but for the, a bigger message about we're fighting for an ideal. And that's what, that's what uh, Tom Hanks was doing out there in the Atlantic. Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's, it's really an interesting emotional experience, maybe not for everybody in the world. I'm, 
be interested in how other people react. But, you know, you see him handle the two sailors who got into a fight, you know, as as you said before, uh, you know, the captain is the captain and he's he's got to be um, flat out about things and he must insist on obedience for all his commands. And that moment in uh, in his uh, his office or whatever office it was, uh, when he when he uh, uh, talked to those two men, um, was somehow to me a, a great statement of leadership. Maybe we're talking here about leadership, and it, and his um, comments and moves on the bridge while all these horrendous and threatening things were happening. Also, leadership. Um, and you, and you, you looked into the eyes of the men around him, uh, taking and repeating his orders. Um, that was a, a crucible of, of some magnitude to see the way they reacted to him, to see the way he treated them. Again, leadership on the bridge. Now, I know, you know, maybe he showed too much emotion sometimes. That's Hollywood. Uh, yeah. But in fact, the, the, the climate, uh, I'll say command climate, because that's what came out of the Greenville case. Um, was pretty good. He was in charge, and he was um, he was teaching them. You know, this one fellow said, "There's a torpedo coming, Captain," and he said, "Remember your training. You have to tell me from what direction <laughs> and what speed and how far away and all that." And you know, he's even in a moment of crisis, he's teaching them. Um, so uh, you know, there's a, there's a command climate thing that actually you know, reinforces the notion of old-fashioned leadership on that bridge, right? Leadership is not orders. Orders come after you have demonstrated respect to your subordinates so that they believe in you and they believe in your judgment. And then you can give any order and they will carry it out. But the, the stereotype of the military just orders people to go and be mowed down. It's not. That's not the way it is. A leader is always out front, and he's demonstrated uh, that he has got the respect of everybody in that ship, so that they they they'll follow him over the cliff if he says it. That's where we're going to go, and that's what leadership is all about. Exactly. You spent some time in the Marine Corps. Is it different? I don't think so. No. Uh, real leadership is about um, showing showing the the, the people that uh, are uh, that are un under your charge that uh, you're willing to do anything that you've ordered them to do, or that you want them to do. Um, I'll give you an example, Jay. Um, when I when the Berlin Wall came down, the Soviet Union collapsed. Anyway, a a, a Russian um, uh, admiral was touring a, a, Na a U.S. Navy ship. And he was in the, in the combat with the fire control system, and there was like a, a third-class petty officer, young sailor, probably 19 years old, showing him what his job was and how he, how he operated this fire control system. And the, the Russian admiral told the people that, was escorting. He says, that wasn't a sailor. That was an officer. You dressed up as a sailor. Mm. We, <laughs> our sailors and our officers from the time they enter, they're all taught leadership and everyone grows from the ground up in the military. Everybody starts at the bottom and they learn leadership skills as they go up. I, I, I tell you, uh, when I was on my way to Vietnam of, of, a first-class black petty officer and I were standing on the gunwale of my ship, and he says to me, uh, and I'm a young, I'm a boot ensign, I'm a young ensign, I'm 22, he says, can I speak freely, sir? And I said, okay, I guess, yes. And he says, do you know what an ensign is? And I said, no. And he said, it's a high-paid E1. In other words, the lowest sailor <laughs> He says, you don't know nothing, but we'll teach you. And they did. <laughs> that reminds me of a, a, of a standard provocation in the first day of school at the Naval Justice School. 
where they had an E-1 walk in a lieutenant commander who was teaching the class, and he was really surly to him. Um, and uh, <laughs> a couple of things happened. The first thing is uh, one of the remarks that the E-1 made was, uh, um, uh, you know, if, if give me one weekend, uh, commander, uh, ashore, and uh, I'll take you around to the places where the enlisted are, and you'll never want to be an officer again. <laughs> <laughs> at, at which point, uh, some Marines, by the way, sitting in the front row of that class, jumped him and pinned him down because they thought they, they didn't know this was a, a, a theatrical provocation to test the class, you know, <laughs> many years ago. You know, but I, I want to uh, go ahead. One one last comment, or when you think about the climate on that bridge, they were up over thirty hours. In fact, the transit across the Black Pit is fifty hours, and and I I have been up on a on a combat ship for twenty four hours, thirty hours, thirty six hours. My CO said one time we were up for fifty hours. I didn't remember that, but you so you, all of the stuff that you're trying to keep track of and 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 give orders on the top of that is you're absolutely exhausted well you saw in the movie he uh he took his shoes off and his feet were bleeding yeah uh from uh tom hanks from standing there so long and he pulled out the slippers that his girlfriend gave him before elizabeth shoe was played that was a wonderful her devilin was her name in the movie um, but, you know, uh, I, I looked at some of the Rotten Tomato type reviews on this, and uh, there was, you know, more, more than was comfortable. They, they were saying there was no character development in the movie. It was about process. It was about life on the ship and on the bridge. Um, but it wasn't about, about character development. And, and you need that for, for a movie. And my question to you guys, uh, you're shaking your head, Michael. Um, and I agree. Um, do you need that? Did it, was the movie deficient for the lack of character development? This was a no-nonsense combat movie. It's, it's like, if you remember Master and Commander, there weren't any, even, even any women in the thing. It was all combat. Uh, and that's what this one is. This is a classic uh, movie demonstrating what it's like to be in combat at sea at war. And and uh, and they're they're carrying out their duties, so developing a character and having, you know, I, it, that's a different that's a different movie. Yeah, I I agree, uh, Shackley. Uh, you know, we we didn't we didn't see the the romance part of this movie either. Elizabeth Shue happens to be one of my favorite actresses, and mm -hmm. with Nicholas Cage, uh, there was a. Uh, a great movie called Leaving Las Vegas oh, yeah. uh, years ago, and she she played you know his his uh, romantic half. She was a, a yeah. hooker or something in Las Vegas. It was a, it was an amazing movie, and, and for me, it, it made her as a as an actress. But she didn't have more than ninety seconds in this whole movie. I yeah. wondered whether she was necessary at all. Well, I thought she was r irrelevant to the story, actually. Yeah. What she was the story? She I mean, even minor character in the book, even even is that right? Actually, he was married to her, and and she was I think two timing him, but um, it, <laughs> that's it, character it, development. It, a little bit, a little bit. There, <laughs> that that very interesting. <laughs> that was about it. I mean, he worried about her when he was on the ship, but she wasn't a character in the book. Was this faithful? To the book, mm. it was actually more faithful than I thought. A lot of the mistakes that I thought were mistakes, Hank took them right from the book. Mm. Um, there was one. There was one mistake that he made, though. Uh, they they broke down the movie into different watches, and, and watches are four hours long. And so you have the forenoon watch, or the afternoon watch, or the mid watch, and then they said dog watch. 1600 to 2000. In the book, it says the same thing, but it says dog watches. And what Hanks didn't know is a dog watch is two hours long. 
And so there's two dog watches between 1600 and 2000. And, and what that does is it means that when you go on watch every day, you never st stand the same watch, you rotate. And that's the purpose of the, of the dog watch. And by the way, the, the, they say the dog watch came from the dog star, which was Sirius, which is the first star you see at night. But I like the Jack Aubrey, <laughs> the, 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 the Pat O'Brien, Jack Aubrey books. Doctor, his, his friend, Dr. Maturin, asks Aubrey, the commanding officer of the ship, he says, what's this dog watch? And he says, well, it's two hours long. It's 1600 to 1800, 1800 to 2000. He says, yeah, but why do you call it a dog watch? And he says, <laughs> because, Mr. Maturin, it is curtailed. Curtailed. Uh, a play on words. <laughs> But that, well, was you know, I, that was a mistake I, on Hank's part. But um, I, I enjoyed the titles. You know, you talk about um, you know how they told you what watch it was and what time it was. Uh, it, it sort of gave you a, a structure. You know, um, this is the morning. This is the evening. This, and they always told you how many hours away from air cover they were, which is you know um, kind of a way of saying how much risk they have. So, exactly, you know, we always ask in these reviews uh, what what we learn, what we can learn from this movie. And, I mean, I must say, uh, I learned a lot, uh, although maybe it was imperfect, um, about what happened on the bridge, what happens on the bridge, the relationship of the, the men to the men and, and the men to the captain and, and the XO and all that and how you get the job done and what happens when things go wrong and... What happens when you have burials at sea uh, for people who are, are killed and, you know, maimed and whatnot? Um, so I learned. Did you learn? Was this any any of this a surprise to you on the, on the technical knowledge that they imparted? Boy, I don't know. Um, I... I haven't been at uh, at sea during war. I've been I've been out on the destroyer for a few days in in a storm, and the one thing I notice is that uh, in a storm a, a destroyer really flops around because it has a high freeboard, and it didn't seem like it was flopping enough. No, <laughs> for me. But uh, and and that makes you really tired. Uh, and that's what I guess that's why the watches are short. But. Uh, uh, the first few days, people are sick and they're very tired. Uh, I don't, I don't know if I learned a lot. Uh, I just thought it was a great story, and I enjoy, I enjoy all those kind of details, you know, about what goes on in a military situation, and um, that's about all I can say on that. Now, Michael, you know, uh, one thing struck me, uh, and I wonder, a, what you learned. Uh, and I mean, maybe you knew it all anyway and from your experience at sea. Um, but also, you know, destroyers. Destroyers were critical uh, in in crossing the uh, the Black Pit in 1942. Critical. Otherwise, uh, many more ships in the convoy would have been sunk. Um, are destroyers? Do they still play that role? There are. I, I remind you, there are no more convoys that I know of. Um, and you know, query what what good are destroyers today? We know about you know aircraft carriers and all that, but um, does the destroyer still play a role in the navy? And what did you learn about that from this movie? Well, the the the, the role has not changed. Um, they escort uh, battle fleets, carriers. They independently steam. Uh, they're all over the world. Uh, sailing to keep open the sea lanes. There's a thing called the Taiwan Patrol that we always did when we transited from Vietnam to Japan and back. We would go between Formosa and Korea and China, and that's to tell China that this is international waters, and 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 we do that today. Uh, they they feel like that's Chinese waters and we shouldn't be in there, but we have destroyers doing that. Um, the McCain was off the Malacca Straits when they had that, their collision. They were independently steaming. Same thing with the Fitzgerald. So the, the, these destroyers are still serving uh, the function that the destroyer can have because it's very maneuverable. 
it's, and it's also, got a lot of firepower. Yeah, the destroyer is a U.S. destroyer that's been shooting down the Houthi missiles. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. They're on their own out there. Mm. Um, but uh, the nonstop, what, what they experience in there, the only thing that I wondered about is it, when I was in combat, when we were in combat, we, we would either be in general quarters where everybody's on watch, or we would go port and starboard, and we'd be on for six hours and then off for six hours. Um, but when you're off for six hours, you're still working. So that's the only thing I that that they would be in those close quarter combat and still rigid with the dog watches of two hours and the regular four hour watches. Um, I don't I don't think that's the way it would have been. I think they would have spent more time on general quarters, for example, if they're in close quarters and not in general quarters. And he was kind of proud that he, he he wasn't in general quarters the whole time. Now there was one moment in the ship uh, in the movie where the where the ship had uh, sunk a German submarine and everybody was applauding that and um, and you know taking it easy there for a moment and he gave a visible sigh of relief and ten seconds later there was another attack and they went to general quarters again. So um, you know one lesson I learned is you. You, you can't really relax uh, in a situation like that because it could happen again and again and again. You have to be ready to go to general quarters any time. Um, and that, and that, so that's pretty stressful over a period. Well, let's let's go to ratings now. Uh, Shackley, you want to go first? Uh, you, you know, you can go um, uh, one at, at the lowest rating or 10 at the highest rating. Um, or you can go above above ten. Many of our reviewers here on Think Tech go above ten when they when they feel they need to. Um, so, can you give us your rating of this movie in the, in the you know in the, in the in the fullness of your life experience and your movie experience, uh, and tell us why? Well, I'd give it a nine on a scale of one to ten, and because I didn't, I really didn't like the uh, scene where the German U-boat captain called him up and, and uh, you know, told him that he's the gray wolf and he's going to get the greyhound and all that. I, the, I thought that and uh, that lowered the quality of the movie. It made it a Hollywood movie for me. And and also I thought that this, the initial scene with the, with the lady uh, was irrelevant to what was going on. Other than that, I thought it was a very good movie. Yeah. Michael, your thoughts? I gave it a seven to an eight. Um, puff, puff like a like a navy commander would do that. You know what I mean? <laughs> the captain of the ship. Let's be tough. <laughs> I I uh, from a an experience, I give it a ten plus. Uh, no question. Just because I I watched the movie for technical and for enjoyment, so I critiqued it very closely as I watch it the first time and then I watched it with my wife just for entertainment and it's over it's way over 10 uh, but technically um, I give it more like a 6 so you know kind of an average there but there are so many errors in there uh, that I was disappointed that they didn't I mean they had they had three marine consultants who, who either gave them the right advice or they, or they ignored it um, because there's there's such blatant errors in errors in bridge commands, in factual errors, contact errors, technical errors. There was one there was one scene in there where they should they say there's a submarine bearing one nine zero, which is off the port quarter, off the left of it, aft, and then they pan up. And you see the convoy, and you see the ship, and then you see the submarine, and it's over on the right quarter. I mean, <laughs> not, you know, I was wondering about that. This, this throwing these bearings at you, left and right, literally left and right. It's like, my God, what does that mean? That he's coming at you zero eight seven or or zero one zero? What does that mean? <laughs> well, you know, on the ship, you. Um, you, the bearings are off of the ship, so it goes, it goes 380 degrees, you know, 360. I mean, 360 degrees. So the front of the ship is zero, 180 is aft, and they were saying contact port 010. 
Well, we wouldn't say that. We would say bearing 350. So you know where it is. There's no such thing, port 010. That, I mean, that technically was such an error. So that's why I gave it like a five from a technical standpoint, but uh, over 10 from an entertainment standpoint. And there, there's just one thing that, and I agree with Shackley about the the girl didn't add to the thing at all. And the, the, the submarine commander talking to him would never happen. They don't even get on that talk between ship system, the, the Germans. So, but, you know, a Navy captain doesn't look at himself as a hero. He's doing his job. And the closest to Tom Hank to realizing that he may have been a hero and he may have been somewhat embarrassed about it, but happy about it, is at the end when that ship of sailors or uh, uh, soldiers are cheering him. It was, it was a troop ship. It was a troop ship. And they're cheering him. And he, he, I mean, they're cheering him as a hero. They saved his life. And maybe he's a little bit embarrassed by that because he doesn't, he's just doing his job. But then he has this smile and he accepts the cheers. So he accepts on behalf of his crew. <laughs> that was Never. very emotional, wasn't it? With all those uh, so soldiers and sailors on, on that other ship passing by. That was really um, a, a powerful moment in the movie. Well, when I was in Vietnam, many times a Marine platoon or an Army platoon was trapped on the top of a hill and they gave us a distress call. And they they spotted our rounds around the hill. He said, "Don't worry about getting too close." And and we would shoot just a few feet around, and they would spot them, and we would save their lives. We'd wipe out the VC that were about to the Viet Cong were about to overrun them. And over the net came this wild cheering and laughing and thanking. And I mean, everybody on our ship were just. I mean, I, I I'm getting uh, goose pimples just remembering the joy. <laughs> of us saving those Marines and sailors or soldiers on the top of those hills so many times. And, and that's what Hank was feeling. Yeah. Shackley, did anything Michael say cause you to reconsider your original rating? Well, he, he knows more of the technical stuff than I, than I, I do. So uh, I can understand why his rating is what it is. I, I was mostly rating it as a, as just a, a movie, right? Yeah. Well, would you? Well, in what? How strong a recommendation would you make to somebody in a generation that you know has no contact experience or understanding of the greatest generation? Oh, I'd uh, say. Would you recommend? Would you recommend they, they see this movie? Oh yeah, I think it's a must see. Uh, it's it's um, it's in that line of uh, we shouldn't forget about this whole era. And 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 what the, what uh, uh, the whole world went through, um, and lots of people lost their lives. And I mean, I know it continues to go on with Ukraine and the Middle East and all that. So I guess um, that captures the the current imagination. But uh, we wouldn't have the we wouldn't be free today if it wasn't for all those people. There's no question about that. Just think if the, I mean. You go to Europe and, and uh, um, you know, the Germans controlled all of Europe and they would have kept it if he hadn't attacked the Soviet Union, I think. Yeah. Um, any of that affect your uh, rating, Michael? I'm just trying to negotiate well, here. Oh, from an entertainment standpoint, I, I tell you, it's 10 plus. Uh, I, I would recommend 100 percent anybody to see it. You know, my technical rating is only because you know, I went down and I, I looked at every single time they gave an order that was just wrong. And uh, they had technical mistakes all through it. Some of them were, were they should never have made the mistake. So but but the movie needs to be seen by everyone. And it's it, it's a it's a 10 plus as an entertainment and getting its message across. I agree. Let me uh, give you some thoughts I've had just in the four corners of this discussion. Uh, number one is uh, it was really well made, you know, and as a movie. Um, you know, the, the lighting and the, uh, the the camera angles. I watched for that, you know, I always do. 
Um, the sound, the music was really outstanding. The, the music built up to a crescendo when it had to, you know, some movies are, 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 are made worse by the music. In this case, the, the music was an important part of the movie. And finally, from my observation, you know, I was watching the credits. I just wanted to see who the military advisors were <laughs> and all that. But, but beyond that, at the very end of the credits, they had the, the guys who did the CGI graphics. Because, you know, you, you can't have a convoy these days. There are no convoys these days. You have to build that with, with graphics. It, it has to be, um, you know, a, a Photoshop. And, um, and the number of people involved in those graphics were hundreds of people. The crew, you know, what, 30 maybe? Um, but the people involved in the CGI graphics went on and on and on. And guess what? Most of the names were Indian. But I, th mm. I found that was very interesting. They must have done the graphics, you know, in, in India. Mm. And finally, you know, one thought I have is that this is, I mean, I, I've seen um, Tom Hanks, you know, in talk shows. I, I kind of understand a little bit where he's coming from. Uh, you know, as a as a member of the society, a member of the Hollywood society, um, and and I um, and I think that um, he he wants to demonstrate that we have to appreciate our military. We have to appreciate what happened in World War II, you know, the greatest generation, but we have to appreciate them now. Um, and I think. You know, that's an important message because not everybody does appreciate them. You know, when the draft ended in what, uh, in the 70s, uh, all of a sudden there was no connection, except for you guys, there was no connection between the average citizen and the military. And so we, we country, lost um, the kind of nexus we had with the military in the war and in Korean War and all that, uh, and for that matter, Vietnam. But, um, you know, this, this movie is... a among other things, the message is that they're us. Those people are, are our people. They're Americans. And they have leadership and also courage. They're willing, you know, put their lives on the line. We haven't had that kind of connection in a while, politically. So maybe, just maybe, a few people will be affected. Your comments, am I wrong? Am I right, Shackley? No, I think that's right. I, I, I think if we, you know, it helps. Um, educate those who uh, who have no exposure to the military about uh, some of the history that that is has preserved our country. Um, it is true that since we don't have the draft anymore, you wonder what kind of stake people feel they have in the country and what sort of obligation they have to uh, come to its defense when that's necessary. I know we say, well, all volunteer force is superior and so on. But in my day, you know, there was a draft and everybody went and everybody had that experience in common for better or for worse. Some people hated it, some didn't. But but uh, but I, I think it was a it was a good social uh, activity for, for uh, educating people and making them feel like they had a stake in our democracy. Thank you, Shackley. And Michael, um, you can close. Well, I'm sorry this wasn't in the major theaters. When I watched Master and Commander, the whole theater shook from the cannons going off. And if this had been on a on a big screen in the theater, it would have had a big impact. And also, it would have reached a lot more people. Only people with the Apple TV get to watch this thing. So it's a limited audience. And how many kids are going to see that and i you know i i've always felt that honor you know service is so important uh i wish everybody was required to at least serve something go to peace corps go in the military serve your country um so that you you learn what it's like to do something outside of yourself to serve the country and that's what all those folks were doing on that that ship on tom hanks ship they were serving the country and saving America for and and freedom and defeating.
fascism. Uh, so that's a powerful message, and I just wish more people would would be exposed to the book, to the movie. It's a great movie. Thank you, Mike Lilly. Thank you, Shackley Raffetto. You guys give a powerful description of this powerful movie. I really appreciate that. Aloha. All right. <laughs>